Good morning. I call the State and Local Government Finance and Policy Committee meeting to order today, March 16th, 2023. We do have a quorum present. Um, let's see. Representative Bonner, since you're getting settled, um, would you be willing to make a motion to approve the minutes from March 14th, 2023? I would absolutely be willing to move the minutes of March 14th, 2023. Thank you. Is there any discussion to the minutes of March 14th? Seeing none, all those in favor of adoption of the minutes of March 14th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Representative Cagle. Good morning, Representative Cagle. I'm just going to take a few minutes and let people know what we're doing today, and then um, we'll begin with your bill. Um, this morning, we have several bills that have been placed on the agenda and are posted publicly, but um, we are also going to have several agencies here to talk to us briefly about their budget proposals for this year. So we're just going to keep things moving very quickly this morning so that we can get through all of the agencies that are here this morning. So Representative Cagle, welcome to the committee. And I will move that House File 2405 be re-referred to the Transportation Committee. Would you please talk to us about your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair members. So House File 2405 is um, the Infrastructure Resiliency Task Force. And so um, what this really does is establishes a task force um, membership and duties. Um, one of the things that we've done through the Sustainable Infrastructure Committee is really take a deep dive on how um, collaboration is working between um, our agencies as well as how we're managing our assets. Um, one state we looked to was Michigan, and Michigan has a really neat structure. Um, in 2016, they enacted the 21st Infrastructure Act, 21st Century Infrastructure Act, and then out of that um, came the, inf the Michigan Infrastructure Council, and um, through that process, they've really been able to elevate asset management as well as um, co-beneficial projects and um, reducing the cost of um, providing uh, actual physical infrastructure to the residents. And so um, it's a really interesting model, and I would like to see if it is a, um, if there's a possibility to do that here in Minnesota. Um, and with that, I, I believe, um, is there testifiers on this one? I don't have anyone okay. from the public who's previously stated. I can ask, is there anyone from the public who would like to testify on House File 2405? Seeing none, we can move to member discussion. Um, anyone on the committee wish to speak to House File or have questions for the author on House File 2405? Lead Nash. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just a quick comment. The fiscal note posted at 9-11 p.m. last night. I'm just not sure that the public has had a full opportunity to review that. It's pretty late. Um, I'm not going to play any reindeer games, but just going to point out that, um, well, I think my point is well made, that fiscal note came in awfully late. Uh, we've got a reasonably full gallery, and it's something that is uh, of a weighty nature, and the fiscal note is not insignificant, but uh, we should be waiting for them to post, I think, in an appropriate amount of time so that the public can digest them. But thank you. Representative Cagle, do you have any, are there any other comments? Uh, Representative <coughs> Nadeau. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Cagle. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I did do a little reading on the Michigan, on the Michigan Advisory uh, Council. Can, I was, they, they produced, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't spend a lot of time digging in it. I, I did the best I could. Um, can, you, can you point to some of the significant contributions that they've, that, 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 that advisory body made to the state? Other than just reports. Representative Cable. A lot of reports. Since uh, we are not Michigan, <laughs> maybe you would want to speak to the value of your task force to the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Representative Nadeau, I think one of the um, things that we're looking to um, 
established with this task force is really um, that coordination collaboration that they've been able to, to achieve um, in Michigan. With that, they've, uh, if you want to go back and watch um, my committee when the Michigan Infrastructure Council came in and presented, it's a really interesting um, topic. And they saw um, 20, to, they said that they have seen 20 to 30 percent save cost savings in their projects. Um, but also one of the things that's really neat is they built an asset management portal um, or a dig once portal. So, and then they also opened it up to all asset managers in the state and um, really developed a asset management champion program that uh, that uh, communities across the state have participated in. And it's really focused on changing their um, kind of mindset to managing assets to really being asset managers. So maintaining uh, physical infrastructure, um, and really thinking about how those systems interplay with each other. Thank you, Representative Cable. Representative Nadeau, did you have a follow-up? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. And, and uh, I didn't mean to uh, try to bring Michigan into the argument. It was just brought up a couple of times as the model that we're looking, that we're looking at. And, and um, because I'm inclined to you know, think this is a, a, is a pretty good idea to, to look at um, and see how counties can also participate mm -hmm. in in this. There are certain counties across the state that uh, that share assets with townships, with um, with local units of government, um, pr trying to provide more efficient services. So I was I was hoping that maybe you could touch on that that part of it. But um, but thank you and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And like I said, I'm going to run a really tight ship today. We have a lot to get through, and I want to make sure that our agencies have the time and respect that they deserve. Representative Cagle, would you like to close up the bill? I just really want to thank everybody for, for participating in this. Um, it's been a really interesting process, and I hope that we can um, really make a difference when it comes to um, funding our projects across the state. Thank you very much. And with that, I will re refer, I will renew my motion that House File. 2405 be re-referred to the Transportation Committee. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion prevails and House File 2405 is re-referred to the Transportation Committee. <laughs> Representative Cagle, you have our next bill. House File 2406, and I will move that House File 2406 be re-referred to the Transportation Committee. We now have the bill before us, if you would like to proceed. Uh, well, we have some amendments. Okay. Uh, we have the A1 amendment. Is anyone offering the A1? Hearing none, we will move to... Oh, is that mine? I have no idea. Yes. Representative Nadeau to the A1. Uh, we're not going to do an introduction of the bill first, but I'm right. happy to... We'll just put the bill in the order um, that the author would like, and then we'll go to the discussion of the bill. Okay. Um, so this this amendment basically um, okay so thank you madam chair I move this uh, I move uh, 2406 and all this does is put an end date on the on the on the on the coordinator position um, I think that this is probably a really um, I, I kind of like this I kind of like the idea of this in and it kind of corresponds with 2405 as well um, finding those ways to be efficient building that infrastructure Building those partnerships over the next, you know, two or three years, um, almost like training the trainers, you know, so that so that we we can um, we can co-opt and collaborate that relationship between the agencies <coughs> um, and the spending and the, the the new federal spending that's coming in. Um, I think that again, I think that if if nothing else, we can extend this at another time. But having a end date in this particular thing with this particular position and groups. I think would be a, a very, um, I think it would be an important thing because I think it would put, I think it would focus that, th those employees on making sure that they're focusing on the most important things of bringing the money in and, and coordinating our efforts. So I move this, uh, I move this amendment. Okay. Representative Cagle, do you have any, just, uh, would you like to respond to the A1? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I would suggest a no vote. I'm um, just looking at lines 1.14. Um, you know, there will be subsequent federal appropriation acts. Um, reauthorization of transportation spending is always one that comes every few years. And um, so I, I want to make sure that um, this is something that we're investing in in the future as well. Thank you. Is there any further discussion to the A1? Just follow up, Madam Chair. Uh, please, Representative, uh, Representative Nadeau, usually once you present an amendment and the 
author of the bill has responded, then we just will move to other discussion. Um, Lead Nash, oh, Lead Nash would like for me to recognize you, so please. So thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not trying to be um, I'm just unreasonable. This morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had federal funds coming into the state for decades. This is nothing. This is nothing new. This is a new position, and um, and I think it's an important position. That's why I, I brought the amendment. <coughs> I just wanted to stipulate that federal funds coming into Minnesota is nothing new. It's going to continue from now until the end of time. So with that, I'll be done. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Nadeau. Lead Nash. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And to the author, if I could. Please. Uh, Representative Cagle, you've got a defined endpoint for this role, uh, or at least the appropriation. You've got it uh, in 2025. And it seems to me that Representative Nadeau's uh, amendment makes sense that you would put an end date on the position as well. And to his point that we've been having this come in for years and years and years makes sense. My, my worry with, with situations like this is that we create a role that may no longer have a job after a certain period, because this will come as a surprise to nobody, the federal government is not always reliable on delivering everything. We, we oftentimes see things not happen. So um, I, I think that in order to keep government trim, uh, we should have an end date on this. And uh, as, a, as a result of that, Madam Chair, I would ask for a roll call on this. A roll call has been requested. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further discussion? Mr. Westerman, if you'd please take the roll. Chair Cleveland? No. Chair Cleveland? No. Vice Chair Hewitt? No. Vice Chair Hewitt? No. Representative Nash? Aye. Representative Nash? Aye. Representative Bonner? No. Representative Bonner? No. Representative Berg? No. Representative Berg? No. Representative Freiberg? No. Representative Freiberg? No. Representative Hansen? No. Representative Hansen? No. Representative Harder? Aye. Representative Harder? Aye. Representative Her? No. Representative Her? No. Representative Joy? Aye. Representative Joy? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Representative Nadeau? Aye. Representative Nadeau? Aye. Representative Newton? No. Representative Newton? No. The nays are eight and the ayes are five. With five ayes, eight nays, the motion does not prevail and the A1 is not adopted. We have an amendment, the A2. Is anyone offering the A2? We will not be offering that. Okay. Goodness. Representative Cakel, uh, the A2 has been withdrawn. And um, w do you have any testifiers? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, if we could please ask uh, George Shardlow of MMB to come forward and present his testimony. <clears throat> Welcome back to the committee. It's good to see you this morning. If you would please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is George Shardlow, Legislative Director with MMB. Um, I'm excited to be here to testify today in support of House File 2406. This bill would provide additional capacity to MMB to lead the enterprise in the pursuit and implementation of federal infrastructure and related funding. Like many states, Minnesota has a relatively decentralized approach to pursuing federal dollars. <coughs> Agencies pursue and manage funds with oversight and some strategic direction from MMB and other entities. However, during COVID-19, we implemented much more centralized review and coordination of new federal funding. From this experience, we learned that cross-agency coordination ensures the greatest impact for our work and our dollars. With the passage of the IIJA and more recently the CHIPS and Inf Inflation Reduction Act, the stakes for a coordinated and strategic approach to federal funds are incredibly high. MMB in partnership with the governor's office has already done significant work to begin this effort 
setting up cross-agency working groups, stakeholder calls, and a website with an award tracker. The funds in this bill would allow us to multiply those efforts to create a web tracker of upcoming funding opportunities for state and local entities, to, co to coordinate more with external partners, in particular as we optimistically anticipate the appropriation of additional state matching dollars this session, um, and, and to respond to what's been um, said, I think the added color here is the coordination I referenced was made possible by one-time funds related to the COVID emergency. And so as a result of the work that was done through that temporary funding, we saw the value in coordination that I referenced. So this is meant to sustain that cross-agency work going forward. Thank Happy you. to stand for any questions. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to testify on this bill? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to member discussion. Is there any discussion? Representative Harder. Thank you, Thank you Representative Cagle. Uh, can you just share with me, so it talks about that there's a coordinator and support staff. Is there any indication, do you know how many support staff that will be needed? Do you have any idea? Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Harder, we estimate between three and four. Thank you. Representative Harder, is there a follow-up? Thank you, Chair. Is, is there a, f a fiscal note on, on, on that as to what the cost would be? Or is that all? M Madam Chair, Representative Harder, it's, um, it, it's an appropriations bill, so that the funding is in the bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, if you'd like to close up your bill, we'll... Um, I'm just very excited for the um, for the direction that we're going, and I think um, we have a huge opportunity right now to really make a big difference in um, the way our state not only functions but um, our infrastructure. I think that's such a vital thing, um, and they all interplay together. And so um, I want to make sure that we're coordinating those projects and getting the best best bang for our buck. Thank you, and um, I should have referred to you as Chair Kegel. You have been a champion for sustainable infrastructure in our state and making the investments necessary to keep our state a safe and functioning place. So I appreciate your work. And with that, I will renew my motion that House File 2406 be re-referred to the Transportation Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? No. no. All right, there we have it. The ayes prevail and the motion prevails. House file 2406 is re-referred to the Transportation Committee. Thank you. Next, we will have Representative Byrd. Good morning. And as a member of the committee, would you like to make a motion for your to re-refer um, your bill to climate and energy yes madam chair i make that motion thank you and with that we have house file 2170 before us representative berg if you'll tell us about your bill thank you madam chair um i'm really excited to present this bill it um was written up after it was um heard in chair kegel's um committee and it passed unanimously out of that committee and it's been called a unicorn bill and the reason for that is because all parties are on board with it um, industry uh, environmental groups we have letters of support in our packets um, so this is pretty unique um, and it continues the discussion on sustainable infrastructure so by clean is a pretty simple concept. It says the products and materials that are used for public projects like infrastructure improvements should be the cleanest and most sustainable available. When we build a bridge or invest in public building, buy clean will help ensure that taxpayer dollars are spent responsibly on materials including concrete, stu structural steel, and asphalt that are manufactured in a cleaner, more efficient, and environmentally friendly manner. This reduces climate pollution and negative health impacts while supporting good paying jobs here in Minnesota and our nation. 
This bill begins a process to reduce the embedded carbon and environmental footprint in our construction materials in a phased incremental manner. First, we create a task force led by the Department of Administration that includes stakeholders representing materials manufacturers, the construction industry, labor, environmental organizations, and state agencies. The task force will examine various construction materials, work with product product manufacturers begin to collect data and start the process of creating environmental product declarations for a variety of specific construction materials. Eventually, we will have a pilot project and then down the line, we'll set maximum numeric values on a product by product basis that will be included in bid specifications included in state construction pro products. The tax force and stakeholders throughout the industry will play a critical role in shaping how this rolls out. As you will hear, the industry is already moving in this direction. Manufacturers are beginning to create environmental product declarations already. The goal of this bill is to create a process to move this work forward in a coordinated way with all stakeholders involved. One other point that's important to make, America makes cleaner products than those that come from our foreign competitors. This bill is intended to make sure that we're supporting Minnesota industries, especially companies in the cement, steel, and asphalt manufacturing. And with that, Madam Chair, I believe I have a testifier or two. All right, we will then next move to testimony. <coughs> I have uh, Margaret Levine followed by Bob Ryan. Welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Uh, thank you, Chair and committee members. I'm Margaret Levin, State Director for the Sierra Club North Star Chapter. The Sierra Club is the nation's oldest and largest grassroots environmental organization. We represent over 50,000 members and supporters in the state, and we're also a founding member, along with the Steelworkers, of the Blue-Green Alliance. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning and express our strong support for the Buy Clean and Buy Fair Minnesota Act. State level action is crucial to reducing carbon emissions and avoid the worst effects of climate change. But along the way, we can also build a strong clean energy economy, improve our community's health, and ensure good family supporting jobs. Buildings are a major source of climate pollution and the issue of emissions that are embodied throughout the life cycles of building materials, as Representative Berg talked about. Uh, it's recently emerged as an important concern with their manufacturer accounting for 11% of total carbon emissions globally. So this bill takes an important step towards Minnesota doing its part to address this portion of our climate pollution. The proposed pilot will explore a state-specific approach to reducing emissions in these materials. It will help support manufacturers to use cleaner and greener processes and technologies. We also hope it will lead to using the state's considerable purchasing power to buy clean so that we are thoughtfully using the taxpayer dollars we're already spending to reduce climate change and support a strong workforce. We're pleased to join labor, business, and environmental organizations in supporting this pilot and urge your support for the bill. Thank you very much. And with that, Bob Ryan, if you'll come forward. If you'll please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning. My name is Bob Ryan. Um, thank you, Chair Cleborn and members of the committee. Uh, as I said, I'm Bob Ryan, uh, District 11 Rapid Response Coordinator for the United Steelworkers Union. We're North America's largest industrial union. Uh, District 11 represents workers in Iowa, Kansas, mm -hmm. Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. I'm here to, today to speak in favor of House File 2170, Representative Berg's Buy Clean Bill. Buy Clean is a policy that levels the playing field for companies that are doing things the right way. It also incentivizes those that aren't making the grade to get on board if they want to grow the opportunity for the businesses. Under this bill, makers of concrete, structural steel, asphalt, would be required to submit declarations that show how much climate pollution was generated, making the products we use to repair and modernize Minnesota's infrastructure. This is, an import, this is important because many of these imported products and materials for our nation's infrastructure could be made by workers here in the United States instead of in countries with lower environmental and health standards and higher emitting facilities. 
Many manufacturers in Minnesota and the United States are cleaner than their global competitors. And the USW members are ready to supply the materials and products we need to fix Minnesota and our nation's infrastructure systems. Taxpayers deserve to get the most bang for the buck, both in terms of using the most climate friendly products and ones that support good jobs here in the United States. The bottom line is that we make steel and other materials in the United States where we make products better and cleaner. We should reward workers and companies doing the right things the right way by buying clean and buying fair when it comes to the materials we use to rebuild Minnesota infrastructure. We should buy clean to support and grow a good family sustaining union jobs. Thank you Representative Berg and the co-sponsors on the bill for bringing it forward. The members of the United Steelworkers strongly support the effort to buy clean when it comes to our state's infrastructure and we are ready to do the job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. We appreciate your testimony. <clears throat> Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, we'll move back to member discussion. Lead Nash. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the author, if I could. Please. Uh, on line 4.2 through 4.4, you've got a requirement for a notification to the bidder to be in writing on a supply chain specific environmental product declaration. And I'll give you a second to get there. Okay. I'm sorry, um, Lead Nash, would you repeat the lines? Yeah, yeah. sorry, I'm just, just no, getting over me. a cold. I, I sound no, a little, little kludgy. Um, 4.2 through 4.4. <laughs> and my question for the author is this, and um, from past experience, there have been sometimes um, delays that we see because people in uh, bureaucratic roles don't always want to move quickly on things. And I'm wondering, as this moves through or uh, later on the floor, could we put in an amendment that says that that notification has a time frame upon which it has to be delivered to the vendor? Um, and I'll give you an example. So uh, there's, a, there's an, a group called SHPO, and it's been in different departments. And sometimes they held things up because they personally didn't necessarily like something. Uh, and we, we actually had to move them from one agency to the next. And what I'm trying to avoid is people who may not like a certain vendor or a certain product or other things, and therefore they just say, well, we, we can't, we can't. Chair Nash, or Lead Nash, I would just like to ask you not to impugn the motives of our state employees. Uh, well, Thank you. I, that's all. Madam Chair, it was a well-established, right. uh, it predated your time here at the legislature. But, but we have the, the, also very good employees and to speak about all of the employees in an organization. Please just move on. Would you be willing to look at a time frame uh, upon which that letter has to be delivered back to the vendor? Please respond. Thank you, Madam Chair and Lead Nash. Um, it's something that we could consider. We're in ongoing um, conversations with all stakeholders. Um, I do have someone here who could maybe speak to that a little bit better. I think Mr. Macarius knows this issue quite well. Excuse me. If you would please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Kyle Macarios here on behalf of the Blue Green Alliance. Um, Representative Nash, um, thank you for your question. Um, um, first of all, we are open to uh, suggestions. There is a, a very robust stakeholder process happening right now with uh, manufacturers, with the Concrete Paving Association, the Asphalt Association, steel manufacturers. Um, I expect there will be some changes to this bill before. Uh, we get through our, 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 that's probably the next stop. Um, uh, and, and the answer is yes, this needs to be, um, this needs to work, right, from an implementation standpoint, and, and we need the, the buy-in of the manufacturers to make this work. And so um, a lot of the work of this bill is, is, is being handed to this task force made up of industry stakeholders that will work out these kinks and make sure that when um, there are deadlines in place when there are requirements in place in 2026 and 2028 that these kinks will have had plenty of time to get worked out. Thank you. Representative Berg, would you like to say anything else before I move back to members? I do believe that question has been answered. Thank you. Lead Nash. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm just trying to establish the fact that we should create service level agreements uh, for both sides of the equation. And if we can put something in writing, then I think that that just makes it uh, more measurable and more fair for everybody. So thank you, and maybe you and I can work offline to find a, a way to slide that into the bill. It, I don't think it changes your bill. It just puts some, some guardrails around when do things get delivered. Um, and it was meant as a well-intended question, Perfect. Madam Chair. 
I appreciate that, Lead Nash. And uh, Representative Berg, I appreciate your willingness to work with Lead Nash on that issue. Um, is Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Berg. I like this. Um, <coughs> so the only thing I wanna, I wanna add that I'm, I, I have one question, um, I think regarding if we end up with only one supplier that meets a standard, and this standard, as I, I, I mean, maybe Mendel will put them in the in the in the standard spec plates and, and those things. I'm not really sure. I don't think we're there yet. But um, it's what happens if? What's your thoughts if we only end up with one with one vendor? So we we lose competition. Representative Berg. Um, I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Nadeau. I appreciate the question. Um, I'm going to refer to Mr. Macarios again um, because I want it to be an accurate answer, even though I have my own thoughts on it. <laughs> Please state your name again for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, uh, Representative Cleavehorn, Kyle Macarios, uh, on behalf of the Blue Green Alliance. Representative Nadeau, um, that's a great question. That can't happen, right? I mean, it just shouldn't happen. We don't want to um, limit competition in any way. We need to have an open, competitive bidding process. Um, you know, I'll point out that th this bill envisions a five year runway before there are standards set in place. The idea and, and, and involves some funding that will go out to product manufacturers to start creating these environmental product declarations. We're going to take our time to gather the data, give the departments the authority to, to, to gather the data that's necessary to set standards that that industry players can meet um, in order to actually before this gets implemented. Um, and, and so that that you're right to raise that question. Um, that would be a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we envision we think that the task force process that we have set up will, um, by the time this becomes fully implemented, have solved that. Thank you. Representative Doe, did you have a follow-up? Yes, and, and thank you for that. And I, I really I really do appreciate that. And I trust the process that um, you've got the, 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 the task force members look like they're super um, engaged and involved. And I like where this is going. Um, the only thing I'm going to add is that as we as we move along, we just make sure that with the fiscal component, you know, um, Everybody wants to make sure that we have the most sustainable building products out there that are also affordable. Um, so hopefully that will, and I, I trust industry will bring that to the to, to bear as well. So with that, thank you for bringing it, Representative Berg. Thank you, Representative Nadeau. Representative Berg, if you'd like to close up the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I had about a third of the answer Mr. Macario said, so I'm a little proud of myself on that one. Um, so. As many of you have said, my side's been quiet, but your side has been very helpful. Um, we had great questions in um, sustainable infrastructure. So we've got a lot that we are going to look at. So, so thank you, Lead Nash and Representative Nadeau. Um, this is a really exciting bill for uh, what I laid out in my opening. Um, and I think that this is something that works for everyone and going forward is going to address um, climate change. I just had uh, industry in my office with Mr. Macario's great discussion. And it is very very rare that we do get that sort of um, group uh, dynamic that agrees on largely everything. Um, and we have we have some things we're going to put in it. I think you're going to like the final bill. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And with that, I will ask that you renew your motion that House File 2170 be re referred to the Climate and Energy Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I so move. Thank you. And with that, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion prevails, and House File 2170 is re-referred to the Climate and Energy Committee. Representative Herr. And Representative Herr, there are several people who wish to testify on your bill, so I'm going to ask, um, because I'm trying to move everything along this morning, that a testimony be limited to two minutes each. Um, if you would please move your bill. House File 1234 to be re-referred to Ways and Means. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, that uh, is my motion. Okay. Thank you. The bill is now before us. If you would like to speak to the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. And thank you for hearing House File 1234. This bill has been in the works for over two years and has been through 16 revisions. A working group that negotiated the terms of this bill includes members from 15 entities representing cities, chiefs, labor, pension, law enforcement, and firefighters. 
No one entity got everything that they wanted, and everyone made concessions they might have preferred not to, but ultimately everyone agreed that duty disability, the duty disability process needs to be addressed. The health of our law enforcement uh, officers and firefighters, our cities, mis municipalities, and of the pension plan depend on it. Madam Chair, I just this is a big bill, and so I, you know, I, I do have a summary of the bill, but I won't go through that if, you know, if because of time. But I will just point out four things that I think are really important for this committee as we have this discussion. Is one, this bill provides the much-needed opportunity for employees with psychological conditions to get the treatment that they need. The employee's treatment, salary, and other benefits are paid for by the employer. This bill does not change Paris' current administrative process for uh, reapplication, nor does it change requirements or eligibility for the requirement process. Members currently submit one written uh, report for a medical provider stating that the member remains disabled once a year for the first five years and then every three years after. This bill just simply codifies that process. That process was already in place. Denials of applications are incredibly rare. In the last two years, PARA has only processed over, PARA has processed over 2,000 applications and only denied two. The approval rate for reapplication is 99%. And I think many of you have been getting emails uh, from people stating uh, otherwise. And I just want to be very clear that uh, a lot of misinformation has been put out there in the efforts to sort of thwart this bill. Um, but um, I just want to make sure that the committee knows that PARA does not anticipate any changes to the member experience in the reapplication process as a result of the bill. I do just want to note one last thing is that the bill did have hearing in public safety and judiciary already, and it passed with bipartisan support out of judiciary. So with that, um, you know, there's specifics to the bill, but if anybody um, has questions regarding that, just know that we are providing benefits to uh, our law enforcement, um, police and fire who may have uh, um, suffered mental injury on the job. And this uh, puts into place uh, to ensure that they get the treatment that they need. And we know that our law enforcement officers love their jobs. They want to be back in the job. And the ability to have them treated uh, will uh, allow them to come back to do their jobs, but also um, you know, um, ensure that plans stay healthy for active members who are still working as officers. So with that, Madam Chair, I do have testifiers, and we can have them come up to speak. Okay. If we can please begin with Doug Anderson, and then next, we, following Doug Anderson, we will have Jenny Max. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Doug Anderson, Executive Director for the Public Employees Retirement Association. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, Representative Herr did uh, very well mention the misleading information that has uh, reached some of our members. And I would like to just reiterate some of what uh, we've heard and how we would address it in really two areas. Uh, first, to reiterate, the annual reapplication process is not changing. The reapplication process is different than the initial application process and only requires that a previously approved member submit one medical report. That's it. There's no fee. There's no need for an attorney. Last year we had over 1,000 reapplications with only one denial. That was a general plan member. PARA did not deny a single duty disability recipient a member reapplication. The bill only codifies in statute what we are doing in current practice. We are not changing what is required to be submitted. We're not changing the timing of when it is required to be submitted. And we are not trying to achieve a different result with our process. Uh, the second area I'd like to address it relates to the pension offsets. Uh, we are proposing new pension offsets, but the offsets are not dollar for dollar of all reemployment earnings, as some members have been misled to believe. We have some members who now believe that there is no incentive to work. We do not believe that to be accurate. Currently, it is possible for a duty disability recipient that has reemployment earnings to have more net income than an active member. This is possible because disability recipients have non taxable benefits, paid for health coverage, and are not being required to pay para contributions. They can have income, some of it tax-free, up to 125% of what an active member in a similar position receives, all of which is taxable. The purpose for the offset changes we propose are to make total compensation for disability recipients that return to work, which is their disability benefit plus their reemployment earnings, comparable to compensation for active members, which is their salary minus their para contributions. Our supplemental sheet that we um, have provided provides more detail on the offsets and an example, and we will be sharing that information with uh, members who are currently on a disability, uh, duty disability recipients. Uh, in conclusion, I'm gonna ask that all our members who are concerned about this bill read that document carefully. We will be distributing it to them. 
Uh, and uh, I'm going to reach out to all the members that have contacted me with their individual concerns so I can address those and give them the right information that they need to have. Thank you for hearing my testimony. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. We'll move to the other testifiers and then we'll call you back up if we have uh, questions for you. Jenny Max will be followed by John Swenson. Good morning, Madam Chair. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Yes, absolutely. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jenny Max, and I am the city administrator at the city of Nisswa, as well as first vice president for the League of Minnesota Cities. I would like to thank the committee and the bill's author, Representative Herr, for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of public safety-related duty disability reform. I'd also like to express my appreciation to all the stakeholder groups for working in good faith throughout this process. I'm confident that Niswa's story isn't unique regarding the challenges relating to duty disability. A longtime officer of the city of Niswa filed for duty disability benefits, and the city was informed that those benefits were approved by PERA. The initial financial impact for this one duty disability claim was over $350,000 that would have spanned over a 24-year period, resulting in a cumulative increase of 14% to our levy which is significant and unanticipated budget impact for a small city and a very difficult process to navigate through without a clear pathway of how we are going to work through that. Along with the financial impact is the human impact. The city believes that our employees are our greatest asset in providing quality services to our residents, our businesses, and our visitors. In April of 2022, the city adopted a new mental health policy for our Nisswa Police Department, which provides mental health resources to our police officers paid for by the city at no cost to the employee. This policy was a first step for us to help uh, show support to our law enforcement staff to hopefully allow them a long and fruitful career in public service. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you very much Thank for your testimony. We appreciate your being with us today. Next, we will move to John Swenson, followed by Chris Parsons. Welcome, Public Safety Director. <laughs> if you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yes. My name is John Swenson. I'm the Public Safety Director for the City of Lana Lakes. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 1234 on behalf of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. I would like to thank Representative Herr and Representative Long for their work on this vitally important legislation. I have had the honor and privilege of serving as a police officer for 30 years in the communities of Minneapolis, White Bear Lake, and Lionel Lakes. And I have seen the toll that this profession can have on police officers and firefighters. I know that this legislation will help our police officers and firefighters stay healthy and continue to serve in our honorable profession. We have worked very hard with all of the stakeholders over the last two years to address mental health injuries of our first responders. Through our work, we learn from mental health experts that mental health injuries are highly treatable, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder. We provide treatment to our first responders that sustain physical injuries. We have to provide treatment for our first responders who endure mental health injuries. This legislation will do that. The key to keeping all of our staff healthy is a focus on prevention, which must be a top priority for our agencies, city leadership, as well as employees. This legislation also addresses prevention by ensuring that all public safety entities have training and programs focused on prevention for police officers and firefighters. We ask the members of this committee to support this important legislation and move it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for the work you do for our communities. We appreciate it. Um, next, we will have Chris Parsons, followed by Ann Finn. Welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, uh, Chairperson Cleborn and members of the committee. My name is Chris Parsons. I'm the former president of the Minnesota Professional Firefighters, and I'm testifying in place of uh, current President Scott Badness, uh, who is attending to a family emergency. The uh, MPFF represents over 2,000 firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, and emergency dispatchers who protect cities large and small 
all across Minnesota. Part of our mission is to advocate for the uh, betterment of the fire and EMS service in our state and for the protection of its most important resource, which is the men and women who uh, at a moment's notice respond to protect lives and property. That's why I'm here to speak in favor of House File 1234. In 2018, uh, as then president of the MPFF, I had the pleasure of working with fire and EMS leaders from around the state uh, on a bill to uh, help public safety officers who suffer mental injuries as a result of their employment. From the beginning, our top priority was to ensure that the people we asked to put themselves in harm's way would get the uh, care they needed when the stress of the job became too much. This was a concept that had broad bipartisan support with chief authors from the two parties. A bill was passed, but unfortunately, the result is our current system that provides zero pathway back to work for public safety officers who seek treatment for mental injuries. Workers who file a claim are invariably denied treatment and must use their own sick leave in order to get healthy. What that means for our members is that when their sick leave runs out, they are faced with having to file for duty disability through PERA in order to pay their bills and put food on their family's table. We need a way that gets firefighters and EMS workers and other public safety officers back to work and the help that they deserve. House file 1234 will do just that. It provides for up to 32 weeks of employer paid mental health treatment for public safety workers who need it and for those who cannot return to the job after treatment, a duty disability. This bill helps local governments pay for health insurance coverage for those who cannot return to work, which is a significant financial burden, especially for smaller cities. This bill also provides an incentive for employers to provide first responders with health and wellness training and resources so that they have the tools to better cope with the daily stresses of their essential work. House File 1234 will also help protect our PRA police and fire uh, retirement plan which allows thousands of our active and retired members to retire with dignity after a decades long career of protecting the public. This bill before you today is a product of many years of hard work. It represents the input of fire EMS and other public safety stakeholders. I implore you to please show your support for the men and women who every day put themselves in danger so that we may all be safer. I ask you to vote yes on House File 1234. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your testimony. And I understand that uh, the league's position has already been uh, discussed, so we will move on to member, well, is there anyone else from the public who wishes to testify? Seeing none, we'll move to member discussion. Representative Hewitt. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, this bill's come a long way since its conception, uh, last time to this time, so thank you, Representative Her. This is so important. Um, it, it devastates me to talk of stories that could result if we don't continue to make sure these individuals get the treatment and the health care they need when they're going through this. I have many stories and too many of good friends that are no longer with us because of this. Uh, they, they go through this crisis, they separate, they go home, and what happens to them there is devastating. So I really appreciate all your hard work on this. It's great that the stakeholders all came together, and I think we have a much better bill than we've had before. So thank you, Representative Herr. Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Representative Herr, thank you for bringing this. It's, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate, Madam Chair, to serve on the Pension Commission with the chair of the Pension Commission. and. Um, it's, it's incredibly complex. Uh, Representative but, Nadeau, if you'll pull your mic forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's incredibly complex what, um, you know, what our pension plans do, um, the actuaries, the work that they put in, the balance that they try to achieve um, to ensure that we have adequate um, retirement and disability benefits. And um, I want to ask one question, question, if you could explain to the, to the members a little bit more, and then I just have one little follow-up. Can you just talk a little bit about duty disability versus permanent disability and how this bill um, affects that? Because I think it's important for people to hear. Thank you. Representative Herr. I, Madam Chair and Representative Doe, thank you for the question. I actually can answer that, but I think it would be better for you to hear from the plans because they can give more specific details. Uh, the permanent disability process actually becomes strengthened through this process. Right. Uh, and, and so um, I'll have um, either Doug Anderson or Ms. Drenge, uh answer that question for you. 
Yeah. And I'm going to ask you to do the Reader's Digest condensed version <laughs> as opposed to the full version. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is Amy Sterney, Policy Coordinator for PARA. I will do the Reader's Digest. Um, the bill also contains a pro provision for duty toll on permanent benefits to increase that from the 60% to 99% percent of the member's average salary. Reason we have 99% not 100% is because our statute limits the retirement benefit for a PNF member. And so we thought parity there is essential. So um, this bill now will adjust how we look at members who have reemployment earnings and occupational disability, a duty disability, versus members who have a total and permanent disability who cannot have any substantial gainful activity. Thank you very much for that. Representative Nadeau. And thank you, Madam Chair. And that was uh, the reason that I wanted that to be explained is because it adds to the, I think it adds to the thought and the complexity that went into this to try to treat people in a way that, uh, that will meet them at the needs that they are. And plus, the, the most important thing that this bill does is provide people the service that they, they need to try to become better. So thank you for bringing this bill. I'm totally in support of it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Nadeau. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to the to the author, thank you. Uh, I, I'm I'm behind this. I've been on ride-alongs uh, with many different police uh, and EMTs. Uh, one most notably was during the night of the second riot uh, in Minneapolis, and I actually saw what happened. Was in the car when that happened, and the PTSD that they go through is phenomenal. But um, so I am supportive. But uh, given that you know me well enough, uh, you'll know that my question is probably on line 2.10. Um, these undefined terms, and, and it says an amount fully necessary to fund the reimbursement, uh, always causes me some trepidation because an amount necessary is, is uh, not a, a really defined term. Uh, and if you could, uh, this is not for a fix now, but maybe you could shed some light on it. I, I always find that a little bit troubling when we don't have defined terms or, or amounts uh, when we put that in a bill because I, I have to think that there's a number out there um, and if, even if you have to round up, I guess, that would at least give us a better talking point than uh, the term of an amount necessary to fully fund. Representative Kerr, it, uh, it does say as defined in Section 16A. Would you, do you want to address that or would you like Mr. Gehring to address it? Uh, and I guess Mr. Gehring can, but I do just want to say that because this, uh, and Chair uh, Cleveland, Representative Nash, this, this um, issue of duty disability is very complex and that we don't know how long somebody actually needs treatment or we don't know, um, you know, depending on uh, different factors involved. And so it is um, difficult for us to be able to give a specific, which is why it is stayed in that way. But if Mr. Gehring wants to provide more context to that, that would be helpful. Madam Chair, I think I might defer to either Ms. Roberts or Ms. James, my oh, colleague. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, my name is Marta James from House Re Research. So the provision that Representative Nash is looking at actually relates to, um, I believe it's 299A.465, mm -hmm. which is the continued health insurance. Mm -hmm. That's an existing statutory provision. And so um, to the extent that there is data on that, that would be a place that a number could come from. I don't have that information offhand. Um, but that's what the relation is to there, to re fully reimburse that amount. Thank you. Lead Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just as somebody who likes details and, and numbers, um, I, I'll look at that offline. But again, appreciate this. Uh, I think this is a, a, a good effort. Thank you very much. Seeing no further discussion, um, Representative Herr, would you like to renew your motion that House File 1234 be re referred to Ways and Means? Yes, Madam Chair, that is my motion. All right, all of those in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion prevails, and House File 1234 is re referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Representative Herr, for this great bill. Next, we are going to move on to our agency uh, presentations. We will begin with um, the Office of Administrative Hearings. We are asking these agencies to please keep their presentations to three minutes. Um, Judge Lipman, if you would please state your name for the record and begin your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Eric Lipman. I'm an administrative law judge with the Minnesota Office of Administrative Hearings. Mindful of the 182nd request, I have very brief <laughs> remarks Thank you. Uh, in, in the nature of an overview of our four budget requests. So the Office of Administrative Hearings provides a high quality 
uh, but very low cost uh, dispute resolution services. Each year we resolve uh, nearly 9,000 cases involving workers who were injured on the job and roughly 700 regulatory disputes between ordinary citizens, your constituents, and either a state or local uh, agency in government. Our, our budget requests relating to deficiency funding, which is in House File uh, 2033, uh, maintaining our, our current service levels, uh, revitalizing our public comment uh, portal for rulemaking, and uh, additional courtroom security um, are four separate requests, but they all pivot around one single idea, which is that dispute resolution services uh, should be safe and accessible to uh, the citizens uh, that need it. And with that, I'm glad to st uh, stand for questions and continue the conversation we've been having with members uh, uh, throughout this session. Thank you very much, Judge Lindman, and we really appreciate your service to our state. Um, we will move on to the next. Thank you. Um, next, we will have the Minnesota Board of Architecture, Engineering, Land Surveying, and Landscape Architects, Geoscience, and Interior Design. <laughs> Welcome to the committee, Ms. Johnson. If you would state your name for the record and begin your testimony. It's my honor and privilege. My name is Doreen Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of the Board of Architecture, Engineering, Land Surveying, Landscape Architecture, Geoscience, which is Geology and Soil Science, and Certified Interior Design. Um, Madam Chair, with your permission, if I may address both that board and the Board of Accountancy in light of the time and the handouts. That would be wonderful. Thank you. I am 50% to the architecture board that I just indicated, and I am a, sta a separate agency is the Minnesota Board of Accountancy. I've included handouts for the members mm -hmm. in your packets for both. I am 50% correct. I am 50% um, staff to the Minnesota Board of Accountancy. Both agencies, I'm here to ask for support of the recommendations from the governor on the budget increase. For both of them, they're asking for some minimal agency support to offset some of our costs that have increased like any other business in the state of Minnesota. And um, so there's that. Um, the other thing I, that is different for the Minnesota Board of Accountancy is we have requested one full-time equivalent in our budget uh, request to the governor and before you. That is for the purposes of this. Simply the two boards have shared, we share office space, we share equipment, you share an executive director, and we had many, many interagency agreements um, as people retired and left and we had 100% turnover of the staff of the Board of Accountancy for all good reasons, um, the, uh, it became very clear um, that both boards, you couldn't ask new staff for two agencies to enter into interagency agreements. And so um, as, I, as uh, Warren Buffett said, uh, you know, you, uh, when the tide goes out, you see who's skinny dipping. And we just couldn't deliver the services anymore with those elimination of the interagency agreements gone. I couldn't ask the union employees to do that. So I'm in desperate need of one FTE for the Board of Accountancy to assist us with changing policies, to updating policies, to do the general operations of the board. And I, you have my deepest gratitude if you will support that increase. Thank you very much for your testimony on both boards. Members, any questions? Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Next, we will have the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. Welcome, Executive Director Sloan. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm excited to be here today. Again, my name is Linda Sloan, and I'm the Executive Director for the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. Very quickly, uh, as you know, we are engaged in all areas uh, where the African her heritage population has been disenfranchised. So whether it's public safety, health, education, it doesn't matter. We're there, we're there in the community, listening to the issues and bringing those issues back to you as well as to the governor. Uh, we have two budget requests. Uh, one is to maintain the level of service. And then the second request is for two uh, FTEs. Uh, one of the issues that we've run into is that we don't have enough support to cover both the African American population as well as the African immigrant population. So I am asking uh, for funding so that I can have people who can be immersed in the African um, immigrant community. 
And I think that that is it for today. So I would encourage you to support the governor's recommendation. Um, and thank you for your time. And Director Sloan, I've watched you in action. You're pretty amazing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will have uh, the Capital Area Architecture and Planning Board, Executive Secretary Clapsmith. Thank you, please Madam Chair. Your, yeah, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yes, I am Merritt Clapsmith, and I'm plugging in my computer because I have a few slides to share with you today. <laughs> please. So if you'll just give me one moment. If you'll state your name for the record one more time and then begin your presentation. Yes, I'm Merritt Clapsmith and I'm Executive Secretary for the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board. And my apologies, I'm having trouble <laughs> with my slides here. Looks like everybody else just gives verbal. So I will go ahead and do that because I know they were handed out. Right. Um, Members, you do have the handout in your, uh, on your To pack. this group, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I am happy to be with you today uh, our agency has three budget requests that I will briefly to describe to you. Uh, we <clears throat> are a very small agency, two and a half staff, and not everybody is familiar with all that we do. So we're a board of 12 members. We have House representatives, Senate, senators, uh, appointees of the mayor of St. Paul and appointees of the governor. And we have a number of very important roles that we play that not everybody is aware of. Um, first, we have joint authority with the Minnesota Historical Society for decisions about any changes that are happening within the Capitol building, all the way down to the detail of what types of screws are used. We have um, oversight of all the commemorative works that are happening on the Capitol grounds. Um, our, those go through our board and we recently updated our application process and review to be much clearer and to invite more public engagement. We have zoning and permitting authority for a 60 block area. So the capital area is a 60 block area which is about half state properties and half private properties. And so instead of the city of St. Paul, if anybody wants to do development, they need to come to us. So for instance, uh, the Sears site, which is currently up for sale. Uh, whoever buys it um, and proposes development will be working with our board to determine uh, what can happen there and how to proceed and we'll work closely with the City of St. Paul on the public infrastructure decisions. So the nature of our work fluctuates quite a bit uh, depending on these large special projects that come up. So one of our change items is general operations. Um, to support uh, staff work. I, this past year, bypassed my health benefits because we had unanticipated costs in our budget that had to be handled and that was the only mechanism to do so. Um, so we'd like to avoid that in the future. Um, we have general rising costs and then we are finding ourselves more in need of special services or training to address uh, requirements and protocols for how agencies operate that large agencies can handle in-house. Um, our second item for our change item is um, an update of Minnesota Chapter 2400, which are zoning and design rules for the 60 block capital area. Um, under state law, uh, we do a comprehensive plan for the 60 blocks, and we update that every 10 years or so. We just recently updated it. And following that, we're required to update our zoning to ensure that it's in compliance. So we're coming up on that and we'll need to hire specialized consultants to do that. Mm -hmm. um, third change item is for a fund um, that would assist applicants as needed with making commemorative works applications and review. Um, it's always been the case that every memorial that's out there is uh, the money for that comes from the applicant group unless they ask for special legislation. It's a high cost barrier. 
um, and it may make it prohibitive for some groups that don't have those resources. So we've asked for assistance um, for a fund that could help defray the costs for applicants. And I finally want to mention House File 2427, which will be coming forward. Um, and this is something that came up um, after our budget request introduced um, by, or of the interest of Representative Cleborne, who's now on our board, and that is to update our 32-year-old Capital Mall Framework Plan. Um, that gives all guidance for landscaping, wayfinding, um, types of events, uh, irrigation, everything that's happening on the Capitol Mall and the open spaces. Um, there's always been a plan, and, and this one is really in need of update. Thank you. And we can discuss that more when we bring the bill forward. I appreciate yeah. your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Executive Secretary. And as a board member, thank you for the great work you do for our state. I appreciate it. Um, next, we will have uh, Executive Director Talk from the Latino Affairs Council. <coughs> And you will be followed by Mr. Whitworth from the Historical Society. Welcome, Executive Director. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Cleborn and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Rosa Toc, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this morning. I'm very happy to see some familiar faces here, including Representative Kosnick, who served on our council board for eight years. So it's good to see you all this morning. Uh, so our council is currently in its uh, 45th year uh, serving Minnesotans. Uh, as you know, and it becomes uh, more evident with the growth of the communities that we serve. Um, the implementation of our statute uh, requires us to deliver on multiple and complex goals with a very slim budget. Uh, but uh, as an agency, we add value to state government uh, through our singular expertise in the quality and objective analysis that we deliver and the direct connections with the community. Uh, I think that by now you must have all received our 2022 annual report where you will read highlights of our work and achievements uh, the last year. So with almost 350,000 Latino Minnesotans growing strong across the state, the work of the council consists in the following, among many other responsibilities. So we work with uh, you, uh, with legislators and policymakers on bills that will help close opportunity gaps in four interconnected areas. Uh, we work in partnership and collaboration with other state agencies in a variety of topics where we uh, offer our uh, advice, counsel, and recommendations uh, so that uh, the uh, actions can touch positively the daily lives of Latino Minnesotans. We deliver bilingual information that our constituents constantly uh, expect from the state of Minnesota. And we also convene listening sessions to engage with communities, particularly in greater Minnesota. Uh, like the tour that we did last summer in five cities to gather the voices of Latino Minnesotans. Uh, so for uh, the next biennium, uh, what we are requesting from, from you is that you support the recommendations that the governor has uh, in its uh, budget. Uh, so what we are asking is uh, for supporting the increasing in our operating adjustments to our biennial base budget and also uh, for the addition of one full-time equivalent for a communications and outreach specialist. Uh, with uh, these operating adjustments uh, and the increase uh, of one FTE, uh, we believe that we can do a much better job in executing our statute, uh, particularly, as I said, because uh, the demands and the expectations of our communities continue to grow. So thank you so much, and I'll be here to ask, uh, I mean, to answer any questions. Thank you, Executive Director Thank you. Talk. Thank you for the great work you do for our state. And next, Kent Whitworth, followed by Sue Jens. Thank you both for being here. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning. For the record, my name is Kent Whitworth. I serve as the director and CEO of the Minnesota Historical Society. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I first want to thank you for the previous support of the committee and the legislature for the work that we do at the Minnesota Historical Society to preserve and share 
the history of our state. Uh, building on the background information that we provided in our previous visit uh, with the committee back in January, it's important to note that the state general fund support serves as the foundation of all the work we do at the History Center throughout our statewide network of historic sites and through the various services that we provide virtually and remotely. Uh, you saw some of these dollars in action when several of you were able to visit with us at the History Center very recently. For those of you who could not join us, uh, please know that you have a standing invitation to visit MNHS at your convenience. The state's foundational support enables us to bring additional resources to the table. Those additional resources take the form of donations, memberships, and earned revenue. And all of these uh, resources enable us to deliver a better history product to more Minnesotans. So with that, I will turn uh, things over to my colleague, David Kelleher, to provide a brief overview of our operating budget request. 45 seconds. Yep. Madam Thank Chair, uh, David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. I'll briefly walk through the governor's recommendations. Uh, the governor has two initiatives or change items. First, operating adjustment or maintaining current service levels. This recommendation is 1.5 million for FY24, 2.5 million for FY25. This is comprised of salary costs for staffing, including health care costs and various other inflationary costs. And this initiative represents a approximately 8.5% increase over the base budget. The second governor's recommendation is for statewide programs, earned revenue recovery. We've uh, lost a significant amount of earned revenue during pandemic shutdowns. And this initiative will help us to cover some of those costs for staffing as we move forward and reopen historic sites around the state. With that, uh, we're happy to answer any questions and um, thank you for your time and support of our work. Thank you. You really do have 45 more seconds. So is, is there anything <laughs> else you want us to know? <laughs> um, happy to answer any questions. Thanks again. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. And it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Sue Jens, followed by Gina Fast. I won't take their 45 seconds. <laughs> If you'll please state your name for the record and the agency that you represent. I will. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Sue Jens. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Arts Board. Uh, the breadth of your committee is uh, really astounding. Uh, we are an executive branch agency. We have not done an overview for you. So you have some materials. You have uh, some brief materials in your packet, and I will refer to that in just a second. Minnesotans care deeply about the arts. Uh, and our work is motivated by the idea that all Minnesotans and all communities should have the kind of access to arts experiences and the benefits of the arts that they choose. Our primary responsibility in state statute is to provide financial support. So the appropriations that we receive from this committee and from the legacy committee is used to stimulate the arts all around the state of Minnesota. We do that through competitive grant making. Uh, last year we awarded about 1,200 grants statewide and we are the fiscal sponsor for 11 regional arts councils so that there is direct support in every county, uh, every community of the state uh, at both the state level and then more at the local level. So our budget increase um, relates to uh, a graph that we have on page, it's the third page of this document. Uh, in 2008-2009, before the legacy amendment was passed, the Arts Board was receiving a general fund appropriation of about $20 million per biennium. Uh, in the intervening years, that has decreased 25%. So unlike a lot of agencies, our budget has not grown. It has fallen off significantly. So uh, with the state's healthy economy, we did submit a change item request to try to get a little bit closer to that, the amount of money we had been uh, 15 years ago. We know there are a lot of demands on the budget this year. We were very pleased that the governor has recommended a $479,000 increase to our budget. And specifically, he is earmarking that uh, to do two things. One is basically a cost of living increase to meet salaries and benefits and IT costs that are increasing every year. But he's also uh, uh, approved a request of ours to add two FTEs in our staff who would work in our finance and grants administration area. We were surprised when the OLA audit came out uh, a few weeks ago that uh, we, are, we are among the top 10 agencies, grant making agencies. Uh, we have a staff of 21 and most of the other agencies have hundreds of staff. Uh, 
So we were really pleased uh, that that would allow us to increase and enhance our ability to provide fiscal oversight and accountability for the public funds that we receive and distribute. Um, we're very grateful to the governor and we're grateful to you for the past support you have provided. We appreciate this time today and hope you can support the governor's recommendation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And our, my community appreciates the work that you do as well. Thank you. Great. Next, we have Gina Fast. Welcome to the committee, Executive Director. If you'll state your name and your agency for the record. Sure. Uh, good morning, Chair Cleborn and members of the committee. My name is Gina Fast, and I'm the Executive Director for the Board of Cosmetology. The board is responsible for the regulation of cosmetology that includes hair, skin, and nail services. The board has over 33,000 licensed practitioners, 5,000 salons, and 30 schools. The governor recommends a base budget increase in fiscal year 24 and 25 to sustain operations. For the board, this funding will cover required salary step adjustments, insurance rate increases, minute-driven improvements, and increases inspector in-state travel and other inflationary increases. I appreciate your time today and ask you for your support for the governor's recommendations and hope I lived up to my last name of being fast. You are fast. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. We appreciate the work you do and your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will have Brent Grebinoski. Is that right? Is that how I say it? Okay. If you'll please state your name for the record and the agency that you represent. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Brent Grebinuski, Executive Director of the Minnesota Barber Board. Um, luckily for you, I'm not a barber by trade, so I am able to keep things brief. <laughs> um, the board regulates the profession of barbering in Minnesota. That's 800 barber shops and 2,000 registered barbers with just three full-time employees. Uh, the board is experiencing cost increase in the next biennium. And because of these increases, the board agrees with the governor's recommendation of increasing our allocation. This increase will allow us to maintain our current level of service and our three full-time employees. Uh, without our increase to an allocation, uh, the board would operate with two full-time employees and that would result in a decreased level of service and an increased risk to public health and safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, members, I would like to just remind you all that you have binders which have full lengthy explanations of what the agencies do. It explains what their requests are. And I ask you to please take the time to make sure that you review that in preparation for our budget uh, overview. Representative Kosnick. I think the committee is holding the binders for us. Yeah, we left them in the room. You are welcome to pick them up. Uh, Mr. Westerman would be happy to get them for you. Um, you're welcome to pick them up for your review. Okay. Um, our next meeting is going to be on Friday, March 17th from 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And we have concluded our business for today. So members, we are adjourned. And thank you to the councils.